Hi, everyone. Uh, like I said, uh, it's the same day that I'm creating this lecture as with lecture nine. So this is lecture 10. Now, before I begin, I would like to apologize. I believe I might have misquoted the acronym for the uh, LGBTQ2 spirit community. So I just want to apologize for that. It's amazing how much uh, putting videos together, creating the lectures, everything has changed. So um, yeah, I, I think I might have misspoke and, and, and mispronounced the, uh, the acronym. Anyway, so I just want to make sure that uh, I'm clear on that, okay? So today, uh, I think, again, I don't think this will be a very long lecture, 35 minutes maybe, maybe 40. And um, again, like I said in lecture nine, the, the ideas that we'll be looking at today will be included for the second grammar quiz, but they'll also help, help you for your final take home, okay? So let's start by insulting your intelligence, okay? <laughs> I'm being very serious. We're gonna start with spelling. Now, I know, I know. Um, I have a spell check, and so no spell check will catch everything. I don't have to worry about my spelling at all, really. Okay, I'm not going to read out the whole poem that I have in front of you here, but this is a poem by uh, someone named Gerald H. Azar. I found it on the web. I don't know why I found it or how I found this, but I was just playing around one day, and uh, I just thought it was funny. He has ode to a spell checker, okay? And notice the way everything is spelled there. The entire, every line, every line has a mistake and spell check didn't catch any of them. Zero. All right. And so, um, sorry, I just want to make sure I've got one setting correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just want to make sure the sound was okay on the lecture. So anyway, so let's just look at just a couple of lines, but then I'll tell you the ones that I love to, to catch in, in essays. All right. I have a spelling check her. It came with my PC. It plainly marks for my review mistakes I cannot see. <laughs> Notice how many mistakes are in that, but spell check didn't catch any of them. Why? Well, because they are actual words, except the context is totally, totally wrong, right? So watch out for that in your own writing. So let me let me give you an example of the, the one word I love to catch in an essay, which tells me you didn't actually edit your paper. Like, like you think spell check caught everything, all right? Okay, you meant to write from, but instead you wrote form. That's a dead giveaway that no, you, you did not edit your paper. So again, like, again you, you think that these are small things, but let's go back to the whole idea of starting at 100 and losing points. Well, no, <laughs> you start at zero and work your way up. And so when you're when you're doing small things like that, where, where, where basically you're not catching the obvious, that's where you start to lose points. So as I said, there's no rubric. It's not like, you know, I, I don't have a checkbox for what have you. But those are the kind of things that basically tell us, yeah, if you really didn't edit properly, uh, you didn't give it enough time. OK, OK. So watch out for stuff like that. But anyway, I just thought I'm not going to read the whole thing up, but I just thought that was a, a funny thing that I found that uh, adds to this whole idea how we rely so much on technology and sure technology is a great thing at times but it's not going to solve all of your problems right like i mean it just isn't all right so there you go so let's just talk a couple of quick rules on spelling because as i said spell check won't catch these things well it will catch a couple of them but it won't catch some of them so let's just take a quick look here let's take a look at the word ride OK. At one time, the word ride would have actually been pronounced ridda, ridda. OK, if you go back to Middle English, that's the way that would have been pronounced. So we think of the word ride having a silent E, but that wasn't always the case. All right. That wasn't always the case. It is true today, obviously. All right. And so what if I want to add an ending? Remember what I was talking about last time at the very end of the lecture? We were talking about prefixes and suffixes. Well, now we're talking about a suffix, okay? Adding an ending to a word. So what if I wanted to add an ending, say an ending, an, sorry, an ending beginning in ing? Well, there are two possible outcomes. Um, again, you, you've got the notes, so I, I won't spend too much time on this, but think of the word writing and then think of the word ridding. Well, 
Let's just say you meant to say riding, but you wrote ridding, R-I-D-D-I-N-G. Spellcheck wouldn't catch that because, of course, the word ridding exists in, in our language, right? I'm ridding my house of all the, all the clutter, okay? So Spellcheck won't catch that. So those are the little things you want to be aware of, all right? So knowing these rules, I think, will help to understand when do we add an extra vowel, for instance, when don't we, all right? So rule number one, when do we drop the final silent E? Okay, or when do we drop the final E? So let's go back to ride, right? I, I think I'm clear on that. The first rule tells us when to drop the final silent E when adding an, uh, when adding an ending to a word. So remember, we're back to the notion of root, the root word. Remember, I talked about that in lecture nine, right? I think this is lecture 10 now. It, everything is a blur, right? Anyway, and so um, keep the final silent E, or sorry, drop the final silent E when adding an ending beginning with a vowel. Simple, okay? Keep the final silent E when adding an ending beginning with a consonant. Now, to be, to be clear, spell check will catch most of that stuff. It will catch it, okay? But there's a few things I still want to be very clear on, okay? You'll, you'll see. So take a word, like, look at like, okay? So if I want to add an ending beginning with a vowel, right? A, E, I, O, U, sometimes Y. Liking. When I add an ending beginning with the vowel, I drop the final silent E. But when I add an ending suffix beginning with a consonant, right, N-E-S-S, -S, then I keep it. Likeness. Simple as that. So, like I said, spell check will catch both of those things, okay? But there are, there are a couple of, ex of examples you want to be aware of. So let's look at the exceptions, okay? There's three common words, and again, again, spell check will catch these, but I want you to pay attention to one in particular. Three common words that do not follow this rule, all right? Argument, ninth, and truly. Now, ninth and argument, not too worried about. But the word truly, I want you to be very aware of, because if you ever or whenever you write, say, a, um, a cover letter, Quite often, you will end the cover letter with yours truly. And for some reason, people like to include the E in truly, even if spell check tells you not to. So be aware of that, okay? Make sure you do not make that mistake, okay? There's a whole lot of other things we could talk about in terms of writing. I'll, I'll give you a quick example. Whenever you are writing a cover letter, always try to make sure that you know exactly uh, the person to whom you are writing, okay? So, um, and the reason why I say that, gender quite often can play a role in that. I have a friend who is, uh, his, his mother is very high up in Canada Post, and her, her name is Jean. But think about that. Because of living in, in Ottawa, many people f just presume that they are writing to someone named Jean. Well, can you imagine if, if you're applying for a very high profile position and you take for granted that you're writing to a male when in fact you were writing to a female, right? What do you think would happen to that application? Anyway, it, it sounds like a small thing, but I'm just giving you a little tip. If you ever are writing to uh, uh, like, like a, a cover letter, try and find out exactly who you're writing to, okay? not just the name, but try and find a bit more background information. I know, I know it's not always possible. I'm just saying, be aware of things like that. All right, or make it gender neutral. There you go. What we were talking about in lecture nine, right? Make it gender neutral, then you're okay. Okay, all right. Now, as I said, the one, yeah, the, the exceptions, truly especially. Now, one other exception, this is, I don't even know if I need to give you this one, um, but after a soft C as in notice or a soft G as in change, you keep the final silent E when adding a beginning, uh, an ending beginning with A or O. But I think spe spell check would catch that, so I'm not too worried about that one. But you've got the examples there, right? Noticeable and outrageous. Okay. All right. Now, this one is interesting. Doubling the final consonant. Spell check is, does a pretty good job at catching this. But because of the differences between English and American spellings, sometimes it won't. Okay. So let me just give you an example quickly. All I mean by that is, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> sorry. There are just times where 
Well, <coughs> I think in the lecture today, we're going to see an example with words like neighbor, right? Color, where sometimes we keep the U if we're doing English spelling, or we drop the U when we're doing American spelling. So that's another thing I'll get into in just a second, okay? Sorry, I don't know what happened there. That's better. Okay. So when do we double the final consonant? Okay. The second, ru the second rule, yeah, when do we double the final consonant when adding an ending? Okay, here we go. When adding an ending beginning with a vowel, such as able, ing, ed, okay, or er, we double the final consonant of the root of the word. Remember, we talked about the root simply being, remember, we talked about run and then running, runner, whatever. So the root would be run. And again, I, I wouldn't ask you anything like that on, on a grammar quiz. Don't worry. I'm just showing you the rules. All right. So we would <clears throat> double the final consonant of the root of the word if the word ends with a final consonant, okay, single consonant, sorry, preceded by a single vowel and is stressed on the last syllable. Sounds really complicated, but it's not. Think of the word commit, okay? So I'm gonna say the word again. Commit, commit, commit. The emphasis, two syllables on the last symbol, okay? On the last syllable, commit, submit, right? Words like that. And so that's where if we were adding on, right? We would double the final consonant. So again, I think spell check will catch those for the most part. I just want to give you these three simple rules. The final one is the difference between IE and EI. And again, it's like spell check is, is quite good at catching those. But I will give you, when you were a child, you probably learned this little ditty, as we call it, right? And so I before E, except after C, when sounds like A, as in neighbor or way, right? But notice, if we were doing this in class, and I had this on the board, the word neighbor would be underlined. The spell check would be telling me that I misspelled that word. Okay, look at it right now, okay? Okay, neighbor. I've included the U. Well, that's because it's British, okay, spelling as opposed to American spelling. And so on the board, or sorry, on the screen when I'm doing it in class, it would literally say, you, no, you, you misspelled that. No, I haven't. So that's another thing you want to be aware of is uh, it, it, like check your, I'm looking at my own screen right now, check what your setting is for um, your, your spellings and keyboards and grammar and all of that, right? Because you can change that. So always a good idea to have it as English, not American, okay? I'm looking at mine right now. It's set at English, right? But it, but it probably, your computer probably came with a U.S. setting. Why? Because your computer was probably made in the U.S. Okay, like Dell or Acer or whatever, right? Well, maybe maybe that's not quite true what I just said there, but I'm sure the settings were set to U.S. spelling as opposed to British, okay? Or, well, not Canadian, but Canadian is British, all right? Okay, all right, anyway. All right, and then, um, yeah, the rest of the ditty, if short E or long E is a sound that is right, write E before I, as in there or in height. So, as I said, Spell check is good at that. Just make sure that you have the proper settings, right? That's really important, by the way, especially if this is if this is your first course you've ever taken at university. It's amazing. That's something you probably should do before you do anything else. Like look at your computer, figure out your settings and all of that, right? Just so that from like once you have the proper settings, indenting, all of that kind of stuff that I talked about earlier in the course, that once you have that, then you don't have to worry about it, right? But you don't want to be making the same mistakes over and over again. Okay, so be aware, be aware. Now, okay, now we're going to get into something that connects back to what we were doing in lecture nine. Okay, I get really confused because nine and 10 and then 11, all, let's not worry about 11 for now. But when we were talking about the whole idea of subjects and verbs, remember, I was telling you, I kept telling you, avoid words like having and giving and all that. I, yeah, don't use words like that at the beginning of sentences because of what I'm about to, to go into now. All right. I'm going to give you many, many examples of real, really poor style. OK. All right. Subject and verbs. Subjects, every sentence, going back to lecture three, every sentence is should be, if it's done properly, is about someone or something, one or the other. 
all right? And that someone or something should be near the beginning of the sentence if you want to keep everything active, all right? Some subjects, okay, the someone or the something, they can be tricky. They might look singular when in fact they're plural, or they could look plural when in fact they're sing singular. And I, it, it sounds kind of confusing, right? Okay. Keep in mind something called a collective noun. These are really confusing. And be because of common day language, some of the rules that I'm about to tell you don't, don't sound correct at all. They just don't sound right because we simply don't talk the way that I'm about to show you, right? You'll see what I mean. So a collective noun is simply a word naming a group. So let me just get ahead of the notes. I've done this a thousand times before. The Ottawa Senators is a great organization. Now that doesn't sound correct at all, right? I, you would think I would wanna say the Ottawa Senators are a great organization, but and in fact, that's not correct. The Ottawa Senators, if I'm talking about the Ottawa Senators as a collective, like one thing, then the verb is would be is. The Tampa Bay Lightning is a great organization. Notice there, that doesn't sound too bad. It's because of that S ending. That's why we automatically think that something is plural. But just because words end in S doesn't always mean that they are plural. So let's do it again. The Ottawa Senators is a great organization. That doesn't sound right, but it is right. The Tampa Bay Lightning, okay, we're talking hockey now. The Tampa Bay Lightning is a great organization. All of a sudden, it sounds fine. So keep that in mind, all right? So I've given you a whole lot of different examples there. You know, I, I don't need to read them all out. But when we're talking about something as one, right, as uh, what we think of as many as being one, a unit, when we think of it as a unit, that's where we deal with it as singular. So off the top of my head, I don't think I have examples here. Think about words like few, okay, or fewer and less. So let's just say I had coins in my pocket, all right? So I have five coins in my pocket, okay, five dollar, like five loonies or whatever. And you have four. Well, then I have fewer Co sorry, I have, you have, so, uh, I'm so sorry. Okay, so we'll do it again, all right? So you've got, okay, you've got five in your pocket. I've got four. I have fewer coins than you, okay? But if I wanted to just talk about money in general, I would say I have less money than you. See the difference? Coins, units, talking about like singular units. The other example, just talking about it as one unit, all right? I think I just confused you there. Let's just let's look at the notes. When you're referring to the group as a unit, use a singular verb. That's all I meant by that. When you're referring to the num the members of the group or the numbers of coins or whatever, then you use the plural verb. Okay, sorry, I, I think I did just confuse you there. But that that's all that means, all right? So if you're looking for, if you're looking at the, okay, I think the example I gave in the very first lecture, U2 is a great band. So notice I'm talking about U2 as one unit, a band, okay? But if I talked about, you know, Bono, The Edge, whatever, then it would be R, okay? Simple, right? U2 is a great band, one unit. But the members of the unit, then it would be R, plural. That's it. Now, now we're gonna get into something here that I, I hope you all take note because this is where we get into trouble when it comes to our writing. Multiple subjects. So we can have more than one subject in a sentence, obviously, okay? When multiple subjects are joined by the word and, this goes back now to something we talked about previously, the compound sentence, right? If we join things with the word and, then we rarely get into trouble. Whenever we join multiple subjects, okay, they will require, with the word and, they will require plural verbs, right? And so in that case, agreement is not a problem at all. But watch out when 
two or more elements of a multiple subject are joined by, and here's a few examples, or, either or, neither nor, okay, neither nor at, in French, ni, dot, 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 ni, ni, dot, 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 ni, right? In these cases, the verb agrees in number with the nearest subject. Now, I know that sounds a bit confusing. When you see the examples, it's very clear, okay? So, if the subject closest to the verb is singular, the verb, okay, will be singular. If the subject closest to the verb is plural, the verb must be plural. Very simple. Instead of worrying about the rules, take a look at the examples. Neither the prime minister nor the cabinet ministers are responsible. Why? Because cabinet ministers is the closest term to the verb, are. But if I flipped it, neither the cabinet ministers nor the prime minister, now notice prime minister is singular. Well, then the verb becomes is. So it's a subtle thing. Uh, probably no one would, would ever probably catch you on something like that if you wrote a, a document for work or what have you. But I just thought, okay, but that is the actual rule. And it may come up somewhere on a test. Who knows? Anyway, all right. Now, now, this next thing I want to show you here, this, it, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I know I'm repeating myself, 10 to 15 mistakes that writers make. Here's one of them. Here's one of the top, all right? Don't be fooled by phrases, okay, that, that look multiple, but are actually singular. I'm telling you, this is the one to make a note, make a note, highlight, big star. Don't be fooled by phrases beginning with words, okay, such as, okay, or beginning with such words as with or like. Then notice in bold, one of the worst phrases you can use in your writing, as well as. It's a horrible phrase. It gets you into so many problems, as well as. And then I could have bolded the rest as well, together with, in addition to, including. I alluded to that in the last lecture. Be careful. Do not, I would argue you shouldn't really even be using phrases like that unless you really understand how to use them. So those phrases are not part of the subject. The minute you include a phrase like, let's just keep, Let's just use as well as, okay? Let's just keep using that, even though all the other, all the others work, okay? As well as, okay. They are not part of the subject. You have to, you have to kind of cross them out mentally, okay? Because they don't affect the verb. So what in the world do I mean by that, right? Now I'm confusing you, right? Okay, okay, simple. My typing teacher, as well as my advisor, then I'm going to ask you to choose the correct verb. Is it has or have? And then suggested I switch programs. Okay? All right. Man, you've got two or three problems here. My typing teacher. Okay? If I was to write the sentence this way, I then have to put a comma after typing teacher. Because as I know I'm getting a bit complicated now, but just try and follow along. The minute I use a phrase like including, Okay, in addition to, or as well as, I've just created a complex sentence. Remember back to the last lecture that I think we just did an hour ago, right? I've created a complex sentence, which means now, I'm sorry to get a bit complicated, but, but it all fits. Instead of having a coordinating clause, now I have a subordinating clause. I've got stuff working on two different levels. My typing teacher, as well as my advisor, oh my God, like, did you not just get really confused? No problem, let's fix it right now. Let's fix this whole, oh, by the way, the answer to the verb literally would have been has. Why? There's only one subject in this sentence. I know, I know, uh, like, like uh, what? I, I don't understand what you just did there. Because you chose to use the phrase as well as. You created a whole lot of different problems in your writing. Okay, let's fix it. How about instead of as well as, why don't I just put and? Remember what I said in lecture nine? I mean, it's so simple, it all falls into place. Well, why not just put and? Well, wait a second. My typing teacher and my advisor. Okay, now all of a sudden, I don't need any commas. 
Like I can get rid of those commas. Well, I've got two sub. Now I know I've got two subjects because I use the word and. Well, now the answer is have. H A V E. Simple. We're in lecture 10, and I keep going back to lecture 1. Minimize your choices. Don't get confused. Don't confuse your writing. Keep it simple. My typing teacher and my advisor have suggested I switch programs. No punctuation needed. No question about the verb. Simple. Right? And so that's what I've been trying to show you all along in your writing. We get too complicated when we start creating complex sentences. Now, am I suggesting that none of you should use complex sentences? No, of course not. But if you're unsure, baby steps. I keep using that phrase, baby steps, right? Fix your writing to begin with, then maybe start, get, start to get more sophisticated, okay? But I hope you see now exactly what I just did there. I could spend an hour on that one sentence, right? Showing you, like, why did you choose that phrase? If you chose that phrase, then you have to have the commas. Then you have to figure out the subject. I'm sorry, then, then you have to figure out the verb. Why? Use the word and. If, if you're unsure, use the word and. Okay? And then, then all of a sudden, everything changes. You don't need the, com the commas. And the answer for the verb is have. Because now you have a multiple subject. But the way I've written it there, it's a singular subject, even though it doesn't look like it. Believe me, I didn't get all this stuff. When, when I first learned all this, it, it was confusing to me as well. Keep it simple. And that's it. That's it. For the rest of the lecture today, I think I'm just going to show you just some, some interesting things when it comes to usage and all that. But that's the rule right there. All right. Like what? 27 minutes. OK, go back to it. Make a note of that. Get rid of, if you're confused, get rid of phrases like, okay, as well as, together with, in addition to, including. Okay? We love using them, but quite often it'll screw up our writing. Final point, if you know how to do it, don't worry about what I just said. But if you don't, and if you're confused, get rid of them and use the word and to connect things. Simple, all right? I was going to make a whole lot of jokes there, but I won't. Anyway. And is your friend. Okay, the word and is your friend. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. All right. All right. You know I want to make the joke now, don't you? Who's your daddy? <laughs> and. And is your daddy. All right. And is your friend. Who's your daddy? Okay. Anyway. And then we have words ending in one thing or body. Whenever words like that are used as subjects, right, they're always seen in the singular. I think you know that, though. You, you know that already. Somebody is going to get hurt. No big deal. Yeah, yeah. I think we're only going to go about 35, 40 minutes today. All right? I hope you're enjoying these lectures, all the thought that I put into them for the humor. Anyway, so if we have each or either of or neither of, whatever, again, they take the singular verb. And so there's the example I have there. Either was suitable or each wants to win. Okay? So singular. Yeah, okay, so the next part here is going to be very straightforward. Then we're going to end on something that is a bit like, like there's a, a, a few things that, that I want you to be aware of when it comes to capitalization. So let's go through page five very quickly, okay, very quickly. In um, the verb in a sentence could be a sing, sing, single word or it could be a group of words, right? And um, it's really interesting. People who are learning English. Uh, they, they tend to make this mistake. And so if you have relatives who maybe are learning the English language, see if you ever notice this, all right? There's something called helping verbs. Sometimes the verb, right, like, like, like uh, John hit the baseball. Well, sometimes a verb, hit, might need a help, might need a bit of help. So let's just say John hitting the baseball. Well, in that case, the verb needs a bit of help. John was hitting. Right. So let's just look at the example there. OK. Helping verbs are often at, are often added to the main verbs so that the, the so that they can be expressed precisely. So the word shall, should, may, can, could. I'm not going to list them all. All of these are helping verbs. So sometimes they become part of the verb. Right. All I'm trying to show you here is the verb isn't necessarily just one word all the time. 
right? And so the complete, sorry, the complete verb in a sentence consists of the main verb, it, right, or hitting, plus any helping verbs. And so one verb in particular always takes a helping verb, okay, and here's the rule, a verb ending in ing. Isn't it funny? Remember, I, I keep saying 10, 15 different rules, if we just fix those, isn't it funny how ing comes back into this all the time? There it is again, right, except in a different context, right? And so a verb ending in ing must have a helping verb, okay? And so there's the example right there. He was hitting the baseball great last week, okay? Or I, <laughs> I actually had one student email me, well, you should have actually wrote he was hitting the ball well last week. Yeah, I know, but if you if you follow sports, no one would say he was hitting the ball well last week. <laughs> anyway, technically, yes, it is, it is. That is correct. But I would say he was hitting it great. Anyway, all right. Oh, God. <laughs> anyway, so um, and then, of course, sentences can have more than one subject. They can have more than one verb. I think I'm boring you with the next four examples here. So there you go. Florence and Rome. So. Notice I've used the word and. Florence and Rome are two beautiful cities in Italy. Okay, join multiple verb or sorry, multiple subjects together with and. Right? Then we know we have multiple subjects. Two beautiful cities in Italy, which they are, by the way. Although if you're ever in Rome, uh, you you may not want to walk too much. Rome is one of the more dangerous cities I've ever been to in my life when it comes to walking. Right? Traffic is incredible. Florence, on the other hand. One of the most beautiful walking cities in the world. You can see so much of Florence within a day, like just because of the way things are laid out. All right. Yeah. Anyway. And then you can have multiple verbs. Right. Uh, he elbowed and pushed his way through the crowd. And then finally, yeah, then we can have a multiple subject and a multiple verb. Uh, the sergeant and the detective. Notice, notice how I keep connecting things with and. Just so I know. Right. Like It sounds a bit simplistic, but I know that my verb. The conjugation will be correct, right? Leaped from their car and seized the suspect. So sergeant and, de and detective, subjects, leaped and seized, verbs. So as I said, let's not, not make it more complicated than it needs to be, all right? Mm. Okay, now the next thing we're going to do, I'll, I'll be honest, I am not going to try and catch you on the grammar quiz for the next thing. I just want to show you something, then I'm going to make a prediction, okay? We sometimes have something called compound nouns. Now, the noun, well, if you don't remember anything from high school about grammar, for some reason, we all remember what a noun is, right? A person, place, or thing. Like, like <laughs> I don't know why. Everyone remembers that. We don't remember anything else, but we remember that. So, there are some times where we have this noun, which is made up of more than one word. And so, compound noun. And sometimes they're hyphenated, sometimes they're not. So again, watch the notes. I think as I'm explaining this stuff, I think it becomes clear. There are things called hyphenated and spaced compounds. And again, once you look at the examples that I've given you, very clear, right? Now, but the one thing that isn't clear, how do we pluralize something like that? And this is something, I don't like this rule. Okay, I'm giving you the exact rule, word by word, but I don't like the rule. I don't think it explains it very well. The plurals of hyphenated or spaced compounds are pluralized by the chief element of the compound. Notice I have highlighted, I bolded chief element for you. For some reason, to me, the chief element sounds like the thing that would never change, right? That's the, the but it's not. The chief element, according to the rule, is actually the thing that could change. So let's just take a, an example, like, Take a quick example here, mother-in-law. But if I want to pluralize that, it's not the in-law that would be pluralized. It would be mothers. So mothers-in-law, right? Rather than saying mother-in-laws. So the chief element, and this it, it's weird the way I'm saying this, but the chief element is the thing that could change. So that's the hyphenated example. Oh, and my prediction, I think we're, we'll be getting rid of hyphens in this kind of usage, I have a funny feeling they're going to go out of style in the next five to 10 years. I really do. Because there are so few, few examples that we use on that nowadays. Then another example would be Governor General, 
Well, we could have a surgeon general, we could have a lieutenant general. So again, the word that could change, that's actually the chief element. So then we would have instead to pluralize governor general, governors general. So it's a small thing, but as I said, um, just be aware of that, all right? You wouldn't write, well, okay, you, you, you could write governors generals, but then it would become a, a possessive. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to do that with you on your quiz. But for those of you who really follow this stuff or really understand, it is true. I could have actually written governors, meaning plural, and then generals, but it would be general apostrophe S. Right? Confusing, right? Anyway, if it, look it up if you need to. So I'm, I'm simply trying to show you there's the possessive, but then there's the plural. The example I have on the page is the plural. But to do the possessive, you would then literally write apostrophe S after general. But again, but I won't ask you to do that on the quiz, I promise. Okay? All right? Okay. Then we have quotation marks. Yeah, we're going to be about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Quotation marks. So, and I'm not joking. The, the one thing I want you to be aware of for your final paper, quotations, okay, quotation marks come in pairs. And I think I might have joked about that early on in the course. Uh, I've seen papers where you'll have a quotation mark at the beginning of a paragraph, but then there isn't anything after that. Like there's no place where it ends. So in other words, the entire paper has been a quotation. Right? So, and I'm, obviously I know that's not what you meant to do, but watch out for that too, okay? And so basically then the quotation marks obviously show where your words kind of end and then another author's begin and end. Okay, and then we've already looked at how you put the you know references into parenthetical notes, right? Parentheses. Okay, so uh, and the only other thing I think you need to be aware of, let's just say you have a quotation within a quotation. It happens every once in a while. Well, then a quotation within a quotation is punctuated by single quotation marks, or or just like what looks like an apostrophe. So you have the doubles. Always the doubles are on the outside of any quote. But if it just so happens that there's a quote in, inside, then those are singular. That's all. That's a simple. Simple, right? And that's about it, okay? So now, let's just take a look at capitalization. Now, boy, there's so much we could talk about. I could easily take an hour on capitalization because it gets really complicated. It can get really complicated, all right? So there's, there's seven things, really, that we need to know. I'm sure there are exceptions you could find, right? But anyway, the first person pronoun, I. I found, I found this really interesting why we actually capitalized the word I. When I was a kid, I, I figured, and I'm sure many of you did too, well, of course you would capitalize the word I because it's referring to me. I'm important, right? In fact, that's not why we capitalized the word I the first person pronoun. We capitalize the word I simply because back in like, like in the 1400s, okay, so we're thinking Gutenberg, but we're thinking of movable type and, and printing presses. The, the, the letter I is so small. It was the smallest, smallest uh, uh, type that, that you would use to put into, you know, a, a press uh, for what we think of as photocopying nowadays, right? Yeah, I could get into it's a really interesting story. But what printers found was because the eye was so small, when they went to to basically do their editing, they would miss the when the eye was meant to be on its own, they would miss it simply because it was so small. So printers simply decided, let's make that bigger. Let's capitalize it. That's the reason why we capitalize the word I nowadays. Like it interesting, it just it, it's utilitarian, right? It's functional. And so that's why we capitalize the word I when we're using it at referring to yourself as a pronoun. Interesting? I don't know. I, I thought so. Anyway, second, we capitalize the first word of a sentence. Oh, my goodness. Well, everyone knows that. Really? How many languages do that? Not many. English is one of the rare languages, one of the rare languages that actually capitalize the first word of a sentence. We take for granted, right, just being like 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 culturally culturally centered right uh or ethnocentered we th we just think that everyone like every language does the same thing that we do no we don't so 
the names of, uh, sorry, the capitalizing the first word of a sentence. It's an English thing, a couple of other languages, but not too many. Arabic, no. Asian languages, no, right? So there you go. Now, this is where it gets a bit complicated. The names of specific titles. So if I was just to write the word doctor in a sentence without referring to anything, then I would not capitalize that. But if I refer to Dr. Smith or Dr. Whomever, because it's a title, then I capitalize it, all right? So the same becomes true for number four. This one, I'll have to give you a little tip on that, all right? In number four, the names of specific places, that's a bit different. Well, I should, sorry, I shouldn't say different, but that's a bit tricky. This summer, I'm going to go visit out west, or I'm going to go teach out west, okay? Would I capitalize that? No, because you see, out west is not a specific place. But if I said something like, I'm going to teach this summer in North Carolina. Well, now North Carolina, that's a specific place. Therefore, I capitalize it. So I think the, um, the easiest way to remember that, if I'm thinking of a place, can I find it on a map? And if I can find it on a map, literally like with a name, then yeah, I capitalize it. But if I said East Coast, there is no East Coast. Like there is no specific area that says East Coast. And if you're from the East Coast, please again, don't email me. Well, I was like, no. <laughs> if you can find it literally on a map, then you capitalize it. But if you're simply referring to North, South, East, West, then you don't. If it's just general, right? Okay. Number five, the days of the week and the months of the year, okay? But not the seasons. So, right, winter, summer, whatever, we don't capitalize those, all right? Now, number six is a bit complicated because of the way that I, I, I've tried a thousand different ways to word this, and I just can't figure out how else to say it. We title, okay, or we should say, we, we capitalize the titles of publications and movies or whatever, unless, of course, the movie itself chooses not to be capitalized. OK, but we don't include articles. Now, what I mean by that, I don't mean a journal article. I simply mean articles as as in a and the of like words like that. Those are not capitalized. But every other word, like the main words, this is the easiest way of saying it. Those are capitalized. So the movie of the week. OK, the T would be capitalized. Why? First letter in the sentence. Movie, capitalize. Of, no. The, no. Week, yes. Okay, so that's how we would capitalize that. Unless, like I said, unless the initial author had, had purposely chosen not to capitalize it, and then you would, you would follow whatever the, the author chose. And then finally, the names of races, nationalities, languages and religions. All of those would be capitalized. And so some of you may have a question about that. Should we capitalize a, a term like black? Well, that's something, remember a long time ago, I described myself as being a descriptivist, meaning I understand how language changes. Well, because of you know racial divides, so many other things, nowadays you will see authors capitalizing the word black even though technically it doesn't fall under the category of being either either a race or a nationality. But we understand why that is, right? So in, in terms of power and everything else. So that's totally acceptable, totally understandable. Now, the only thing I would suggest is if you ever walk into a classroom and uh, your professor decides to capitalize white, then I would suggest run away. <laughs> Drop the course, <laughs> right? You follow me? Okay. So in other words, there are exceptions when it comes to power. I'd love to teach a course on that, right? The whole idea of power and language, right? But that's not really what this course is all about. But I hope you follow what I just did there. I think you did. And so finally then, um, if you wanna have a bit of fun, the subjunctive in English. I, I don't even know why I included it, I do. If you go, on YouTube and you look up subjunctive and Big Bang Theory, 
the television show, you'll get a good example of why I included that there. All right. I in class, I sometimes make a bit of a joke about this, but the subjunctive simply means relating uh, to or denoting a mood uh, of verbs expressing what is imagined, wished or possible. And so uh, uh, let me close on that. It's, it's kind of interesting. Have you ever wondered why? Take a look at the very the very bottom there. All right. If I were you. Well. You would think in, in, in language that we actually should say if I was you because it's all singular. Right. But because it's that rare verb form where it's it's it, 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 like like yeah, I don't, don't even know how to finish that thought. But but it's just a rare verb form that we use. Again, it's just out of usage, you know, common day language. So if I were you, were is actually the plural, but we use it as the singular. That's simply known as the subjunctive. All right. Anyway. OK, so that actually took a bit longer. Oh, 46 minutes. All right. So um, if I were you, I would enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Thanks. Bye.